Welcome into Rounding the Bases, the podcast about culture and leadership with a baseball twist presented by Community America Credit Union. My guest is someone that I met, I don't know, I, I think back probably April or May. He's out of the Phoenix, Arizona area. And the first thing, uh, even well beyond his story, the first thing that struck me is just his energy and and this, I don't know, this desire, this It was just this infectious personality, and you'll hear that, I'm sure, in just a moment. Uh, The the bio that I have on Brian Bogert, and it's worth reading because it's very, very well written. Not all of them are. Some of them uh, are, some are not. Uh, But what his bio says is there is a sleeping giant in every human. Brian's purpose in life is to awaken those giants within and turn them into legends by helping them grab what they believe is just out of their grasp. Brian is a heart surgeon without a blade. He does not start outside with what you need to do. He starts inside with who you are. In a world that is disconnected, Brian is revolutionizing how individuals, leaders, and entrepreneurs deeply connect with their authentic selves to achieve the best version of themselves. As a human behavior and performance coach, speaker, and business strategist, Brian disrupts the normative approach on how to create sustainable growth and lasting change person. Personally and professionally, his philosophies on how to embrace pain to avoid suffering, uh, people before profits, and who before what has helped individuals and companies discover and activate their limitless potential. Brian and his team lead with intentionality as they are driven by their vision to impact a billion lives by 2045. It's a long way, but a very well-written way makes me sound good, of introducing my guest on today's podcast, Brian Bogert. And Brian, I wanted to read that just because like that right there, I think is you in a nutshell, just the energy, the passion that you have for life. I haven't even gotten into the very unique circumstance that happened in your life. We'll get there in a moment, but how are you? Man, I'm fantastic. This has been a little bit of a long time coming since we met, right? Like we knew we knew when we met and we captured lightning in a bottle that it was time for us to continue and communicate a little bit further. So I'm grateful to be here with you today. Uh, and and I love that you did read that bio. What's interesting is that is a recently written and updated bio by uh, three collective members of my team that also mm-hmm. represented their perception of me. So that was what was super humbling about that coming out is that those words were created by three people that are very, very close to me. Um, so that that was actually one of the first times I've heard it read. Uh, I've, others have done it uh, for their shows, but they've you know said, oh, I'll record your bio later and we'll get that in. Yeah. So that was actually, it was kind of moving for me. So thank you for starting with that. Well, I didn't know it was going to have that effect other than I, I had read it you know, before we came on and I was like, this is really well done. And, you know, and I've learned that too as a, as a speaker that, so I wouldn't even call that a bio. I would call it an intro because the yeah. bio says he's done this, she's done that and on and on and on, which is great. It's a resume is what that is. But uh, a, a good intro will catch people's attention and let them know who you are, what you stand for. And so I think that that in a way was able to wet the palate a little bit. There's obviously a lot more, but but kudos to your team for writing that because it was it was really well done and um, i should have done more of a dramatic reading i guess to to really emphasize that no, dude but- it was perfect you moved me like seriously it was cool i you know i'm not i'm not one of those that typically likes to listen to your point like a bio right i've had my bio read read a million times and i actually agree with you i that's one of the things i haven't liked about the bio is it focuses on the what what have we done right you even heard in, in this write-up it's like we focus on who before what and, and an intro focuses on who you're about to meet, who you're about to talk to. A bio tells you what you're about to hear based on their perspective or what they've done. It's a totally different play. So I just appreciate the fact that you you put some energy into it. Well, I, you know, I was thinking about this when I was leading in. I'm not a script guy other than, you know, reading that. I kind of like to go with the flow of a conversation. If this conversation goes well, and it will, it'll really be no different than the first time you and I met on Totally. Zoom. People don't know behind the scenes. We had all it's kinds a great of great conversation. Dis- yeah, it was a great conversation. People don't know. And I'll, I'm happy to admit it that we had some kind of weird technology issues in getting this done, not to mention all the delays of my schedule and your schedule. And so, of course, we finally get together and then technology says, no, we don't want you to do that today. But we're here. Uh, that's life. It, it all works out. So I, I, I was thinking about this leading in that I don't know whether it makes sense 
to right away reveal your big life-changing moment from the start. It's right there front and center on, on your website, brianbogert.com, uh, with a really cool video, or whether that's necessary or not. My, what I mean is this. You had a life-changing event early in your life that is a, very much a part of, I think, who you are. Yet I don't know if, and I'm not trying to minimize it, I know it affected your life, but I think that you could deliver the amazing message that you do with or without that story, although I know it shaped you to who you are. Does that make sense? So it's like, I don't know if that's when you lead with who was Brian Bogert, does it go back to that moment or is it something else first? So by the way, that's a phenomenal question and like a really insightful way to lean in to even getting this topic rolling. Um, What's interesting, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna honor your tee up and actually avoid the story for a minute, and we'll talk okay. around it. And just, just string people along because I think that's that's more fun anyway. Um, you know, truthfully, I did not lead with my story for 15 years professionally. Right, it wasn't something that I, I didn't want any credibility. I didn't want any attention. I didn't want any exposure related to just what I had been through and my unique story because I didn't really feel like it mattered, particularly in my old world. I mean, it sort of mattered, but it, it's, it didn't change who I was. It helped refine who I was by offering perspective. And I think that pain and perspective point us at what's important. So I've had a lot of pain and I've had a lot of perspective. And so I, although I do believe that my messages are not inherently about this unique story that I've been through, it's really more around the philosophies and lessons that I've extracted through life holistically, study of human behavior, my own experiences, and the way that I can allow my living my truth, communicating my truth to give people permission to live theirs. So it wasn't until I shifted into this, what, what, what you would call a personal development world, right, to build an external personal brand, if you will, right, in this space to help people, that I really started to real, recognize that leading with my story opened with attention it opened with something unique and it opened with the ability to move people because they could identify and put themselves into my scenario and imagine the emotion the, the experience the pain the perspective just by hearing it and so what's crazy is when i first started in this space speaking professionally i've been telling my story since i was seven right because it's unique and i've never been shy but when I started actually getting compensated to do this through a lens of helping people, I would never just tell that story. How do we extract those lessons and how do we put them into a place that can be actionable for people moving forward to apply into their lives? Because we all have the ability to tap into the collective wisdom of other people's stories. So for me, when I got into the space, what's interesting is I would tell you that the first element of trajectory, my brand was represented around my story because I led with it. It got attention and it moved people. But as I've refined my process as a communicator, as a thought leader, as someone who can really move and change people's lives, and again, I don't say that to impress from an arrogant perspective, it's to impress on the point. Like that is one of my gifts and one of the reasons I'm on this planet. I can say that confidently now, whereas five years ago, my shame wouldn't have let me say that, right? But what I can tell you is it's really more the other journeys that might have been put into place with my original story or might have happened either way that really are the root of the message. And so I think it's in, very intuitive of you to pick up on that. And it's, you know, one of my business partners says, yeah, Brian's, Brian's got this cool story. And most people think it's because of this cool story, but really it's about his heart. And so I don't yeah. say that about myself through a lens of anything other than you're right. To me, it's just a part of me. It's not who I am. It's not my identity. It's just something that I've been through, just like anything anybody else has ever been through. Yeah, I, I, I think that. I was thinking about it because it's like, I don't know that you have to lead with it. We're going to have to reveal this in a moment or we're going to string people along too yeah, We're going to be like, wait, get to the point, guys. <laughs> right, right, which is what everybody says to me anyway. But, you know, and, and I think the question was going to be, and we can get there later, you know, without without this story, how are you different or are you the same person? I mean, I know it shaped you. But it's sort of like, you know, you don't always want, want to be known for that one thing. Yet if that one thing is what catches people's attention and gets them to where they need to go, then that in itself is a gift. I think that's how I was reading it a little bit. And I, I think I saw exactly on, right. 
uh, on LinkedIn recently. Recent anniversary, I think, for that moment. 29th anniversary. Yeah, 29th anniversary was August 10th this year. Yeah. Okay, so August 10th, whatever, 29 years ago, I can't count. 1992. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so so you're a seven-year-old kid, August 10th, 1992. Uh, this is a lot for anyone of any age to process, let alone a seven-year-old. Let's let's talk about that story now. Yeah, so I'm actually going to tell it through the lens of a story because I think it's more important that way, especially since we teed it up so much. Let's give people the justice of hearing it as a story versus just yeah. a statement. Um, I'm going to actually ask you and anybody who's listening, who's driving, right? Well, unless you're driving, to close your eyes. If you're driving, keep your eyes open. <laughs> but everybody else, close your eyes for just one second, and I'll tell you when to open them. I want you to imagine going to a store, having a successful shopping trip. Heading outside, breezing through the checkout line, you walk out the doors with a pep in your step, you're going to go on with your day. You look up, you feel the warmth of the sun on your skin, you feel the breeze blow through your hair, and you're just excited. When you get to your car, you start fumbling through your pockets to unlock the doors. And as you're standing there getting ready to get in, you turn your head and you see a truck barreling 40 miles an hour right at you with no time to react. Go ahead and open your eyes. That's where this portion of my story begins. My mom, my brother, and I went to our local Walmart to get a one-inch paintbrush. And as we were headed back to our car, I always had an excitement and vigor for life. You described it as energy, my energy, right? I, this energy is not new. It's been who I was since the day I was born. So of course I was the first one in the car because I wanted to get home and put that paintbrush to use. My mom and brother were three, four feet behind me. And this was back in the days before key fobs. So I had to wait for her to literally catch up, stick the physical key in the door. And as she was doing that, catching up to me, there was a truck that pulled up in front of the store and a driver and middle passenger parked and got out. Passenger all the way to the right felt the truck moving backwards. So Joel, he did what any one of us would do, scooted over to put his foot on the brake, but he instead hit the gas. Combination of shock and force threw him up on the steering wheel, up on the dashboard, and before you know it, he was catapulting across the parking lot 40 miles an hour right at us with no time to react. Now, we were in an end spot, so he goes up and over the median, up and over the tree in the median, hits our car, knocks me over, runs over me diagonally, tearing my spleen, leaving a tire track scar on my stomach, and continuing on to completely sever my left arm from my body. So again, it was August 10th, 1992, 115 degree day in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm now laying on the pavement. My mom and brother watch the whole thing happen. They look up and they see my arm 10 feet away. Fortunately for me, my guardian angel also saw the whole thing happen. There was a nurse that walked out of the store right when this took place and she saw the literal life and limb scenario in front of her. I am forever indebted to this woman for choosing to turn into action versus go on with her day. She came over and stopped the bleeding on the main wound and saved my life. And she instructed some innocent bystanders to run inside, grab a cooler, fill it with ice, and get my detached limb on ice within minutes to give me a fighting chance of potentially having my arm reattached, not knowing whether or not it would be successful at that moment. But the reality of it is, is that she saved not only my life, but also my limb. And had she not done one or both of those things, Joel, I either wouldn't be here with you today, or I'd be here today with a cleaned up stump. So yeah, we teed it up, right? It's a unique story. And yeah, it is a unique story. I, I can own that at this point. But what I've also realized in all my time of doing this is that my story is just unique because it's what I went through. We all have unique stories. What's important is that we pause and become aware of the lessons we can extract from those stories and become intentional with how do we apply them in our lives. And we all have the ability to do that. And we all have the ability to tap into the collective wisdom of other people's stories to shorten our own curve to learning. So if you don't mind, I'd like to share two primary lessons real quick that have shaped my life because I think it gives context to the rest of our discussion. And then we'll just, we'll follow, we'll follow the format and see where else it goes, right? Yep. Uh, the first is I learned early in life not to get stuck by what had happened to me, but instead get moved by what I could do with it. And the second, I didn't really realize early because at seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old, I'm being guided through the process. I'm a little bit in the fog. So all of the surgeries and physical therapy, I'm the one having to put the work in on. I, I didn't have to think a whole lot. I was just there for the process. My parents, however, were not in the fog. They were intimately aware of the unceasing medical treatments, years of physical therapy. And the idea of seeing their son grow up without the use of his left arm was a source of great potential suffering for them. So they willed themselves day in and day out to do what was necessary, to do what was tough, to embrace the pains required to ultimately strengthen and heal me. So whether intentional or not, what they did was they ingrained in me a philosophy and a way of living, which was to embrace pain, to avoid suffering. And I believe that when we do this, it's also our path to gaining freedom. So it's these concepts that we use to overcome not only this unique injury, but how my business partners and I scaled our last business to over 15 million within the span of a decade. And now how we flip that on its head to focus on the impact period of my life 
which is all about helping people get back to the core of who they are and some of the stuff that that beautiful bio that was written outlined on our mission to impact a billion lives. Because I believe if we reduce the level of suffering on this planet, that's when we allow people to experience joy, freedom, and fulfillment holistically. That's when vulnerability and authenticity, which are the glue that binds human connection, become in the forefront of all relationships and communication. And people have the ability to stand on their own two feet, not just confident, but convicted in who they are knowing that they won't be just accepted, but embraced for exactly who they are by the world. That's why I'm doing what I do, because it'll leave a better world for my kids and my grandkids. It's beautiful. And, you know, I, I think your greatest gift is not your story. It's your ability to tell it, the ability to, you know, and I, I, I believe that I have a gift of storytelling. I, I, my hesitancy is I always want to be humble, but you know, if you don't have the gift to tell your story or other people's stories, I mean, my personal story is totally different than yours. It doesn't have to be yours, but you know, you can find people that have been through the most extraordinary circumstances, but if they can't share it in a way that impacts lives, they, they don't really yeah. remember it, You're you, right. you know, and you have that ability, which is, which is amazing. When did you figure that out? I, I mean, you had your sort of previous life of, of doing everything that you did successfully in business. But I, I feel like, and I sense that, that this is your sweet spot. This is your purpose. Oh, there's not a doubt. This is my purpose. You know, it's interesting. My purpose and my actual written defined purpose changed for the first time in the last decade recently, because uh, now that I've been on this path for 18 months, it's become very clear to me. It's really a more refined element of my purpose. Cause my purpose started with, I, I mean, you know, my purpose is to be a provider. Then my purpose was to be to was to be providing, and then it was to provide, right? But now my purpose is I genuinely believe that the existence for me on this planet is rooted in one basic thing: to allow my truth, my stories, and my pain to give people permission to live their truth and move through their pain so that they can live a life that's worthwhile. Like I believe without a doubt that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So um, yeah, when did it start? You know, I've been on stages since I was seven, but I, you know, I told my story as a seven year old back then with just a loud voice. And it was more for the shock and awe than it was about transferring it to how do we use this in our lives as a general concept and philosophy, right? So for 20 years of me telling my story, it was really through the lens of perspective, motivation and direction alone. And it was there to help organizations raise money or help people tell their stories effectively for organizations that have benefited benefited their lives positively so they can have a way to give back. That was truthfully like the whole purpose for what I did for 20 years of my speaking. And, and it was about 10 years ago that I started to shift into this professionally. And, and that's when I started to leverage my other life experience, my business experience and the different things to really understand what, what were those lessons that shaped my life? And how do I communicate those in, in any medium possible? Because at the end of the day, right, human connection is so deeply rooted in communication. And communication is not just the words that we say, it's in how we say it, it's the tone, it's the delivery, it's the cadence, it's the body language, it's the energy, right? And so that is one of the things that I really learned is I learned to lean into human connection through vulnerability and authenticity is how to communicate even more effectively so that we can learn where and how to enter into people's souls. And what I mean by that is I think most of us are hardwired to either be more intellectual or more emotional. Right. So perfect example, my daughter and son are both intellectual and emotional, but to really connect and enter with my daughter, I have to enter through the heart or she'll never hear and understand or think about what we've talked about. And with my son, the only way I can get him to feel is to enter through the head. So we have to really understand and pay attention to part of communication is truly not only how do we communicate effectively, but how do we communicate in a way that whoever we're communicating with can receive it. Ooh, there's so there's so much there, Brian. And, you know, I, I really think that, look, if you had had the success in business that you had had, that alone would have been an incredibly, I don't know if it would have been meaningful or not very successful the way we define, you know, could often define success. Uh, now we're talking about finding purpose and what you're able to do with that. But I, I just want to go back for a a, a brief moment because in the business world to have done what you did before you were coaching full-time. And, and I think it was in the insurance world and locked in yeah, companies. Yeah. And 
um, which, you know, locked in based out of, of Kansas City, but yep. um, uh, you helped expand revenue from 250,000 to 15 million. So you, you were finding something there. What, what did you know then? What do you know now? So I think what I knew then, which is consistent with what I know now, is that if I focus on people, it'll all take care of itself. And, you know, if I was five years with another firm before I ended up having the opportunity to help scale that so dramatically over the course of 10 years, which was truly one of the most fun things I've done. Um, and especially doing it alongside the partners that I did it with, because I'm not taking credit for that growth, right? It was, it was a team effort. Um, I was one of the leaders in the office, but, but what I knew way back when was to focus on people. And I genuinely believe that if any business, if we focus on our, on the people from an investment standpoint, both the people that are internal. So our associates and those that work with us or for us, and we invest in the people that we actually want to impact, right? So our customers, our prospects, our suspects, however we want to define that, depending on the business. If we just genuinely focus on the human experience and connection and, and allow walls to come down through vulnerability to build quality relationships that I didn't ever have to sell a day in my life. Mm -hmm. Like I just believed that because if I go in and I have genuine conversations to try to determine what problems might be that they, they might be facing, whether it's something I can solve or not with my own particular solution, it was like, how do I help the individual on the other side? And oh, by the way, in a very complex buying pattern, we could have six different buyers with different initiatives and different agendas. And then it's up to us to try to bring them together into a concise way of saying, okay, here's the vision to move forward. So I was doing a lot of the same work then that I'm doing now. It was really extracting things from people in a way that's meaningful to allow them to understand how do they want to live in this role and how do they want to define their culture as a result of it. And so people was something that always shaped it. That's interesting though, because what I found is that I ran both businesses side by side for about five years. And what I found is the last five years in risk management, employee benefits consulting, it became very clear to me that I didn't talk about insurance at all. The first 10 years in the industry, I talked about it more than I did in the last five, but I didn't talk about it hardly at all in the beginning. What I realized is that what started to happen is that my C-suite relationships, those clients, the ones that were the buying relationship or the decision maker, or the ones that I was responsible for maintaining the relationship with, <laughs> I was really talking to them about how to be better leaders in their organizations, not about the dollars and cents on where we're spending our insurance dollars, right? It was really about how do we elevate their people? How do we shift and shape their culture? How do we understand where our dollars are going from a human capital perspective? And so it was just cool because it was like the same thing I'm doing now with a totally different vehicle, but this is way more meaningful because I get to go way deeper with the individual and the leader in a way that we can truly shape an entire culture because I genuinely believe it's a ripple effect from the leadership. Yeah, that's so interesting because I, I I think that the one common theme, no matter what we do, is always the people. people and I, I say all the time, because, you know, in, in my field, you might get, oh, wait, you're on TV? Or if they're local and they, they watch you within the region, it's, oh, what's it like to meet so-and-so? Or what's it like to be? And, and, and look, this was my dream. I actually am living my dream. I didn't understand what would come of it and the greater purpose and the, the way to help people. So... Uh, you, you know that that's been my platform that's been my ability to yeah. to do something different and share it but when people say what's it like to fill in the blank i say i'm not in the baseball business i'm in the people business i just happen we to all, be lucky enough as someone that loves sports to get paid to talk about baseball every day but it's still the people business by the way every single one is and i say that's that right. all the time it's like when people ask me hey what are you an ex expert in well, I'm as much of an expert in people as probably anything else I do, but that's probably the thing I know the most about because it's the thing I've studied the most because it interacts with everything we touch. And imagine if everybody just focused on becoming an expert in people, how much different our world would be. Like if we focused on perfecting the people versus how to make more profit, how to chase more what's in our world, like literally if we focused on the people that were in front of us, the you know, who we are, who are we doing this for and who are we trying to impact as a result of our work? And we just focused on people. We're all in a people business, right? It starts to unify us in a way that we don't even have to think about because it's, it's not about anything other than, oh, Joel, you're on the other side of the screen for me. I'm going to focus on you. So last question before I get to my baseball theme questions, yeah. because I, I think, you know, again, you were so successful before. You're obviously successful now. 
but everything changed when you found this sweet spot. And I think that, and I'm not saying you weren't happy before. I don't know. Oh, no, 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 you yeah. seem like a, but you seem like a, a very, I think happy is the right word, but I just, I, I, I sense from you that you feel your place in this world, that, that you know what you can do, which is an incredible, I mean, there are a lot of us that could go through all of life, never finding that. I, I believe that I have found it too. It doesn't always come in places that you expect, but once you find it, it is, it's better than any money or anything yeah. like that. What has that experience been like for you to go from being very successful in business to finding your place? Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I still will view myself as an entrepreneur and a business owner and leader because I'm not just coaching and speaking. We're building entities below it. So I hope that the, the uh, success that we talk about in business, right? Like that's going to be something that's just the byproduct of who I am at this point versus having to fit it into a system. Um, you know, I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's unlike anything I've ever experienced and it gets progressively stronger. And over the course of the 18 months, like what I can tell you is that I've been shedding layers of my old view of the world on how it could or needed to operate based on my lens of what had shaped it up until that point, right? So truly like corporate world, more rigid structure, more thought process, different timelines, like ways that we do it. And I've never believed in work-life balance anyway. I think it's a misnomer and it sets us up for failure. So I've always believed in work-life integration, but now I truly have the flexibility and autonomy to do it more than I ever have. And so if I look at a contrast and a comparison, right, it's again, similar to one of our philosophies and I'm not just trying to squeeze it in here. It's just the truth, right? Look, dude, I chased the what's. I chased the what's of the world, right? What house, what car, what amount of money, what amount of success? You've referenced the word multiple times, right? We talk about success in terms of monetary success. We don't talk about it in terms of anything else. And by the way, I had a lot of financial monetary success in that moment. It's just the truth. I don't hide behind it right? I'm not somebody that's independently wealthy at this point. Am I still going to work to continue to provide for my family and create impact? Yeah, I am, right? Although I had financial success. But I'll tell you, I didn't really have success back then. I, I did make it work for what I was. But what I would tell you is I did chase all the what's and I got them all, brother. And I got them all a lot younger in life than I ever thought. And all of a sudden, I woke up and I'm running around and I look around with multiple people next to me, making multiple six figures, seven figures, if not eight figures in some cases. And we were all miserable. Mm. what I realized is by chasing the what I lost who I was in the process mm. because I didn't know that I and who I was was necessarily going to be good enough to fulfill whatever role I felt I needed to fill in this capacity and so was it a version of me was it authentic based in that season of my life yeah it was I had more layers on me so it wasn't as raw and authentic as it is now but it was still me it's just that it wasn't really who I was it was starting to I was starting to become something else so that's when I started to go through this process of shedding those layers of of the what's of the world, all the shoulds and the things that I was told I needed to be, and just started to really align with the, who I was at the core. And what I realized is when I got back to the core of who I was, all the what's in my world became a manifestation of who I am, right? So like right now, my definition of success is joy, freedom, and fulfillment. Brother, like I am as successful as I've ever been and may ever be right now. And part of the reason that I'm even more convicted on this path is because I know what it was like to feel that way in one point in my life, wake up and feel like I was stuck, unworthy, miserable, drained, defeated, you know, but, but living a life that everybody on paper thought was worthwhile, right? And thought I was crazy when I said, no, no, no I want to walk away from all of this and go focus on impacting lives, right? Everybody thought I was crazy. But the really cool part about it now is, again, literally everything is manifesting based on who I am. And I am way happier now. So I knew what it was like to be over there. And I know what it's like right now. I feel free. I feel energized. I feel alive. I feel convicted. I feel clear. And for the first time in the last three months, I've intellectually known that what we're seeking out to do is possible, right? I would have never done it if I didn't think it was extreme, but possible. But in the last three months, something else has clicked because I've continued to unpack layers in myself. The more I lean into who I am, the more powerful it gets. And I will tell you, for the first time in the last three months, I feel us impacting 1 billion people at a granular level in every fiber of my being in a way that I've never experienced. So I know that I've found my way because it's I've never felt what I felt right now. And there are things I've felt way less about that we've absolutely crushed. And you know what? 1 billion is going to be really damn hard. So by no means do I sit here and think that I'm going to do it alone or our team is going to do it alone. It's going to happen through collective, collective impact 
through aligning with people who have similar viewpoints on helping people be exactly who they are, knowing that that's what's going to lead us all to a place to experience joy, freedom, and fulfillment, which to me is the ultimate definition of success. Yeah. And, and when people can find that, again, many never get that opportunity in life. And so that's the task that is ahead. And it's, it's how many do you think put themselves cash. in a position to find it though, brother? Like the honestly, yeah. yeah. Right. I think a lot of people don't find it because they don't actually look for it. Oh, right? don't know and how I think that a lot it. of people, a lot of people have allowed the voices of the world to be louder than their internal voice, which has allowed them to believe that they're going to be a victim and a fate and have no influence or control of their destiny. So what I want to do is help people to understand everybody can experience this. It takes work. It's hard work. It'll be the worst, the heaviest lifting you'll ever do, but everybody can do this if they desire it. I want to get to the baseball theme questions. I also Let's want to let it. everybody know that I, it'll be in the show notes that the website is brianbogert.com, B-O-G-E-R-T. Uh, there's also great stuff uh, and you can find it within the website or if you just type in nolimitsprelude.com, it'll take you to a, a really cool page where you can learn a lot more, possibly sign up for uh, all, all types of different things. I highly recommend that. But let's let's go with the baseball theme questions. And first off, biggest home run that you have hit in your career? Uh, well, I'm going to say my wife because my career is my life. So I think the biggest home run was hands down my wife. I uh, To use a different terminology, I outkicked my coverage. Yes. Right? So we'll keep it sports themed. Um, but I will tell you that she's my greatest confidant, mentor, coach, friend, lover I will ever have. And every morning I wake up and she's still in bed next to me. I consider it a victory right out of the gate because she's still there. Right. So uh, that, that's probably it. Um, I would say second, if we look professionally, um, honestly, biggest home run was leaning into what I'm doing now, leaning into who I am and recognizing that I can walk away from, from the external definition of success and, and actually experience more success in my life. How about a swing and a miss? And what did you learn from it? Swing and a miss, man. Uh, you know, I, uh, earlier this year started a business with a couple of people that I had only ever met virtually mm. and the concept was awesome. Um, but I also used to have a belief that I never really had to test because of the world we were in, which was that I wouldn't ever go into businesses with someone without meeting them in person. Cause I think there's a lot that we gain from transferring energy, understanding body language and who you see in person is not always who you see behind the screen. Mm. And, uh, and, and I broke that rule. Right. And so we went in thinking that we were going to build something that was really cool. And it lasted only three months because I recognized the misalignment with who I am, my beliefs, my ideals, my standards that I was willing to to approach uh, with 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 just general other individuals in the business. And so in a matter of eight days, we tried to resolve it and ended up dissolving the business. Um, so what I learned from it is I need to continue to always live by the standards and belief systems that I have and never go into something unless my gut is 110% in. This was something that my gut hesitated on, but I convinced myself was worthwhile to try. Uh, and, and every time I've done that in my life, I've regretted it. So this was basically concreting, I just need to listen to my internal voice and my gut louder than anything else. All right, good reminder, good lesson learned on that one. The final baseball theme question, small ball. It's what I wrote my book about, small ball, big results. What are the little things that add up to the big wins, the big success, the big results? I love that. Uh, I like to say that consistency is key, but relentless consistency unlocks. And it's all about the compound effect of those things. So that's just uh, that's just a philosophy that, that a lot of high performers understand. Little things for me, um, I, I have them personally, professionally, and in service to others. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but I will say that for me, the little things... One of them is I have to focus on my physical body for a big period of time every day. So it's not so little anymore. It's gotten much bigger. But if I don't stay consistent on that on a regular and consistent basis, it gets to a point where my physical pain is debilitating and I'm not willing to sacrifice that. Um, but little things, right? I, I'm going I'm to talk about something that's way more personal in this case. Uh, truthfully, again, I'll relate it back to my family because I believe that if my family is strong and good, that everything else in my life has the ability to flourish. And that's just my belief system. That's not to say that everybody else should adopt that. That's just, that's how I operate. So for me, the little things are finding intentional moments with my wife and my kids every single day to truly be where my feet are, put my phone down and give them 100% of my attention and my energy. Um, I find that the compound effect, even if it's as little as five minutes in certain moments can truly change the trajectory of my day and theirs. And what I realize is that 
though most of what I do and who I am truly fills my bucket and fulfills me, there's also a significant energy drain from a lot of things that I do and the amount of energy I have to express to convey the messages that are required for people to absorb. And why I say that is these little moments is not just about building the relationship with my kids and my wife, but it actually is one of the few things that truly fills my bucket to the point that it can be overflowing with as little as five minutes a day. So that is something that I won't sacrifice. And what I would tell you is to that point, the only thing that would make me walk away from this mission at this point is if my wife and my two kids are not good. If they're not good mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally, which is my belief system, if the three of them, the three people that are closest to me are not strong and solid, healthy in those areas, I'll walk away from everything else because those are the three that matter most to me. That's a heck of a lesson and one that I need to work on myself. Even if it's five minutes, just put that phone down, walk away for a moment. And I struggle with that. I think a lot of people uh, do as well. Okay, four final questions. We'll go through these quickly as we round the bases. And you kind of touched on this already, but uh, you had a post recently on LinkedIn where you said the month of July was an experiment. And I think it's a little bit of what you're talking about here too. Tell me, how did that experiment go? Yeah, it's hundred percent. It goes back to that work-life integration that I talked about before. Right. And in my old rigid world, that's like, okay, I'm going to work Monday to Friday and I've got weekends here. And so I would allocate my time with my family simply to the evenings and onto the weekends. And I would just allocate. And so that I could be where I needed to be. Um, you know, in this new world, it's not so much that way. I have meetings on Saturdays. I speak on a lot of events or masterminds on the weekends. Um, there's stuff that happens intermittently. And what I find is that there's a lot more true flexibility, especially in the virtual world than even just the corporate versus the entrepreneur world. I, I got to be clear there. It's not just the transfer between those. It's also the virtual transition that we've been in. Um, and I wanted to see if I could experiment by having my family on the road with me as much as possible, right? So that I'm not just leaving them, but having them be a part of everything that we're doing. Uh, you know, it's, it's called the Brian Bogert companies, but we're going to be renaming it the Bogert companies because it's really a family business. And I want my kids and my wife to feel as much a part of it, but also as much of a priority as it is in my life. And so uh, I was in six different cities through the month of July. My family was with me in four of them. Um, you know, we were able to turn a couple of extended trips in San Diego and Flagstaff and other places into longer places where they could have it be their landing location. I'd fly in and out but that they could go experience a, a little mini vacation since I was going to be in the region anyway. Daddy doesn't have to be gone. You'll still see me in the evenings and we can just do it from the road now. Um, and it was, it was a challenge, but a lot of lessons learned and it was extremely meaningful and worthwhile and truly one of the best months I think I've ever had in my life mm -hmm. since we've had kids. Very cool. Second question as we round the bases, we'll go a little bit lighter here. I always ask my guests about something interesting or unique. And, and you mentioned a, a love of cooking. Is that new? Is that old? What's the specialty? It's new. Uh, it's old. Uh, the specialty, I probably I have two favorite dishes. Uh, I do a really mean fettuccine Alfredo uh, with with a breaded chicken or shrimp because my wife is vegetarian or pescatarian. Um, and then I, I do a pretty mean pad thai as well. So I, I, and I love to smoke meats on my Traeger and do different things with briskets and, and burnt ends and stuff like that. I love to cook because I love the experience of food. Um, but yeah, I, I don't do it as much as I wish I could. Third question as we round the bases, it's a, a serious one that just popped into my head earlier. Did, were you ever, ever able to stay in touch with, have you stayed in touch with, or what came of the woman that essentially saved your life? That's an amazing question. And I'm happy that you asked. I've never met her and I've been on a really? mission to find her. So any host that asks, I I'm extremely grateful because it at least helps us put more feelers out into the world to track her down. Um, my understanding is she still lives in Arizona, but I've not been able to track her down. Um, and I, dude, I, I want to just say thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. The reality of it is, is, is I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her. And the impact that I will be able to perpetuate through my life, our resources, our team, our collective impact with our partners wouldn't happen without her, right? If I wasn't here, I couldn't fulfill that role and uh, I couldn't live out my life's purpose. So I'm, I'm forever indebted to this woman. Wow. All right. Well, keep pushing and pushing and, and eventually, hopefully, if she's around, it'll happen. And that'll be just an unbelievable next chapter to this journey. So I guess we'll stay tuned on that one. And I know that with, with your passion and, and determination and discipline that, that it's not going to happen for a lack of effort. Last question, as we round the bases, this is my walk-off question on the website. And I, I was directing people to that. 
uh, and and telling people no limits prelude and there's the big headline no limits grab your free alignment guide what does no limits mean to you brian yeah so we've got this concept of no limits living and i think you know so many of us live within the confines of the limits we place upon ourselves and certainly the limits that the world places upon us and and i don't believe that we have to live within the confines of those limits uh, this is a very personal thing to me. We won't unpack the whole thing behind it, but uh, no limits living is not that we can do anything, right? Look, I've got, I don't have a tricep in my left arm. I don't have a lat on the left side of my back. My biceps, my gracilis for my leg. Could I go be a professional basketball player? No, but could I compete at a very high level? Could I learn how to dunk? Could I make sure that I can master my shot and push myself well beyond what I think I'm capable of? Like learning how to water ski with one hand or do different things. Yeah, and guess what? Anytime we actually see a purpose that's big enough to overtake the pains required to get there, it's possible. And so I just want people to recognize that if we can shift back to who we are, focus on our internal dialogue versus the dialogues of the world, like we can truly start to eliminate those limits that we place upon ourselves because the majority of them are perceived. So many lessons learned so much inspiration it's one thing to be inspirational it's another thing to be passionate about who you are and what you do and and i think that's every fiber of of your being and and it's it's just uh very i mean i talked about your energy that's why it, energy is not necessarily the loudest guy in the room but it's that passion it's that purpose which which i was struck by the first time that i met you i want to remind everybody again brian bogert Dot com. You can learn more about Brian, speaking services, coaching services, courses, and on and on and on, uh, and everything else with Brian Boger Companies or eventually Boger Companies. And I know a lot more coming as well. Brian, thank you so much for spending the time on rounding the bases. Uh, you, you've energized me, and I think I'm a high energy guy already as it is, and, and inspired me to continue to learn as well. So I, I really appreciate the time. Really grateful that you and I have been able to connect. Yeah, dude, thank you for the opportunity. And thanks for building a platform for me to be able to even pour some good into the world, right? Had you not taken the effort, the leap and created a platform for people to learn and grow, we wouldn't even be having this conversation today for others to benefit from. So a lot of thanks goes to you and for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, I'm humbled by the opportunity and I'm looking forward to the future of uh, what we're gonna do together. The feeling is mutual. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate it. Thanks, brother.